Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and this is a free one-hour overview of the Sony A6300. I'm going to show you all the most important features, and I'll skip the least important features that you'll never really need. If you have a different camera and you want a tutorial for it, visit sdp.io slash tutorials. It's a great place to send your friends who have a different camera. If you visit that link, you'll also see an overview on how to customize Sony cameras with, with lots of little tips and tricks that go above and beyond what I cover in this. So after you watch this, go back here and at the very bottom, you'll see that customization video. I will tell you how to take great pictures with your Sony. I will not cover lots of the little like tricky features in there, which I, I don't find all that useful that aren't that core to photography, but I will show you all the very most important things. First up, the physical controls of the camera. If you already know how to do this stuff, look at the table of contents in the description below. You'll be able to jump forward to different parts of the video so you can jump right to the stuff that you already know, but just in case you aren't familiar with the physical controls, first thing that you'll do is put the battery and memory card in. So there's a slot on the bottom here. I'll just slide this down and that will pop this open and you can see the battery slides in like this with the contacts towards the middle of the camera. It'll go all the way in until it clicks. Unfortunately, you'll find yourself doing this a lot. You'll put it in upside down and it will let you get all the way in there. It just won't click like that. Take it out, turn it around, push it in until it clicks. The SD card works the same. Put the label towards the center of the camera, push it in until it clicks, then close this door and slide that up. Your camera should be ready to go. As far as SD cards go, that is your digital film. You can store thousands of pictures on the camera, um, but if you want to record 4K video, you'll need a class 10 SD card. Not all SD cards are class 10. You don't have to buy a Sony SD card, though they make them and they're fine. You can get lots of SD cards at stp.io slash SD. I would suggest erring on the side of getting a larger memory card. So you can see the image here is of a 128 gig class 10 card especially if you're going to be recording 4K videos, especially if you're going to be shooting raw, both things I recommend. It never hurts to have some extra space. And if you ever do run out of space, it can be really frustrating. So I tend to get big cards. Let's take a look at the physical ports on the camera. Over on the left side of the camera here, push the door back and then flip it forward. And you can see three ports. The top one here is a USB port. You can use that for transferring files to your computer. So I prefer to take the SD card out and use a memory card reader. But more importantly, you can use it to charge the camera and the battery. Your camera came with a USB cable. You can plug that into any number of USB chargers or computers. You can even get USB battery packs. That's a great way to charge your camera on the go. These things burn through batteries. So if you're using a camera bag, keep one of those USB chargers and the cable in your bag. And then when you're not using it, just plug it in your bag and it'll be recharging. The second port down here is an HDMI port. It's a micro HDMI port. You could theoretically hook that up to an HDMI recorder if you're recording video and you wanted to do it to an external device, or you could hook it up to a TV and play back your pictures for your whole family on vacation. But realistically, nobody really uses the <laughs> HDMI port. The last port down here is a microphone port that is very useful if you're recording video. You can greatly improve the audio quality by hooking up an external microphone. I'm using a Sennheiser EW100 G3 wireless lab mic. Lab mics will get you much better sound. Unfortunately, the camera doesn't have a headphone jack and Sony does make an external adapter that will give you a headphone jack, but it doesn't give you control over the, like manual control over the audio level. So there's not a great solution for this at the moment, but maybe in the future, something new will come up. There's one more thing to show you physically on the camera and that's attaching and removing the lens. So when you get the camera, you'll take off the, the cover that's on there. Line the white dot on the lens up to the white dot on the lens mount. Then you'll twist it clockwise until it clicks. Give it a little twist backwards just to make sure it's locked on there and you should be good to go. On this particular kit lens, the 16 to 50, you'll notice that when the camera's off, it collapses down like that and it will automatically extend when you turn the camera back on. That's really convenient. There's also a switch on the side here that will let you zoom in or out or you can use this ring here. The um, switch on the side is good for video. It lets you like slowly pull in if you're getting all artsy and cinematic about it. I'll show you how to take a picture. First, you'll turn the camera on by moving the switch over to the on position here. It's nice that it's real convenient and right next to the shutter button because 
What you want to do is turn it on when you take a picture, and then as soon as you're done take, taking the picture and looking at it, go ahead and turn it off. So get in the habit, turn it on, take a picture, turn it off. So I'll turn it on. Just take a picture of the screen here. And you can see it happens really quickly. By default, you can also hold the camera up to your eye and it will automatically switch to the viewfinder. There's actually two steps to taking the picture, focusing and actually releasing the shutter. So when you push the shutter button down halfway, the camera will focus. And here you'll see some green dots appearing on the screen as it focuses. When you push it down all the way, it will actually take the picture. To review your picture, press the play button here and you'll be able to see it. You can then navigate through the different pictures that you might have taken. Push up on this D-pad here, I'll call it the directional pad, where it says DISP, that means display, and you can see things like the histogram. You can hide all the information so you can see just the picture by itself, or you can see the information like the metadata, like the shutter speed and the aperture and the ISO. And if you don't know what that stuff means, don't worry, and I'll explain it in just a little bit. Now, one of the nice things about this and all mirrorless cameras is that whether you're using the back of the camera or the viewfinder, you're by default seeing a real preview of what your picture is going to look like. So if you've been shooting with a DSLR, you're used to taking the picture and then chimping, but looking at the back of the camera to make sure that you didn't screw the shot up. You don't really have to do that with the A6300 because you saw what the exposure was going to be like. You could see everything exactly as the camera was going to record it before taking the picture. So you know, you can get out of the habit of chimping now that you have that. If you are using that viewfinder, it's very important to understand the diopter. The diopter is like a little glasses prescription built right into this rear viewfinder. And if you are glasses wear, you can probably take off your glasses and look through the viewfinder and see things clearly without using your glasses. And that can be so helpful because wearing glasses and using a viewfinder is a real pain. I hate it. It's one of the reasons I wear contacts. But the downside to the diopter is even if you aren't a glasses wearer, sometimes it can get out of its correct position and then everything in the viewfinder will be a little bit blurry. So whether you're a glasses wearer or not, you want to hold the camera up to your eye and just turn that diopter until the words at the top and the bottom of the screen look nice and sharp. Don't even look at subjects in the viewfinder. Just look at the top and the bottom of the screen. I'll show you that viewfinder right there on camera but you'll need to have it up to your eye and then twisting it, just one little click at a time. If you're using the viewfinder and it seems like you can't focus, make sure that diopter set in the correct position. Now I'll go through the different modes of the camera. These different modes will get you out of fully auto and get you into actually controlling the camera settings. So you can control, say, how much background blur you have, uh, how fast your shutter speed is to freeze motion, or you can take full manual control the mode I find most useful is aperture priority, and that's indicated on the mode dial here by that big letter A. So the little white dot there indicates the marker, and by default it will be on auto. So I'll twist that over to A, and now I get to control the aperture of the camera. So if you look at the back of the screen here, you can see down here it says F8. That means it's set to F8. This is my main dial here, and as I turn that, the aperture is also going to change. So now we can see I'm moving it down to f5.6, or I can twist it the other way and use a higher f-stop number. Now, I'm not going to try to describe every aspect of how f-stops work right now, but if you want more information, you can visit sdp.io slash f-stop. I have a whole video there that will tell you all about it. I'll also say, if you're studying f-stops, one, one of the things you can do with an f-stop is to completely blur the background out, but you probably won't get much of that blurry background effect with your kit lens. One thing you can do is to use a different lens, like this is the Sony 50mm f1.8, and it's a great way to blur the background. So it's an inexpensive lens, and I'll discuss it a little bit more in a bit, but as I put it on here, notice I said it's an f1.8 lens. That describes the minimum f-stop number I can use, and as I put it on here, let's look at the keys on this keyboard. As I focus on the Logitech logo here, the keys in the foreground aren't that blurry. Uh, that's because it's at f5.6, which is the lowest f-stop number your kit lens will use. But this is an f1.8 lens. So now if I go down to f1.8 and get that in focus, look how much blurrier those keys in the foreground are. That's because lower f-stop numbers mean lower background detail. High f-stop numbers mean higher background detail, background or foreground, anything that's out of focus. 
Here's a quick example of how f-stops work. There is an iris inside of your lens and inside of every lens that, when you're using a low f-stop number, gets big and wide, like this image over here on the left. And as you use a high f-stop number, like f22 or f32, it gets really, really small, actually letting less light in. Now, the camera's gonna make sure that you get the same brightness of image, even if you're using a really small diameter iris uh, or a big diameter iris. To quickly demonstrate the effect of these different irises, here's a picture taken at f1.8, and you can see just how blurred the background is over here. Take it at f8, and you can see the background starts to come into focus, and then at f22, the background is nice and sharp, and you can see everything from the foreground all the way to the background. And that's the kind of creative control you take as a photographer when you know what you're doing. So, as I said before, a good way to learn more is to watch this video at stp.io slash f-stop or check chapter four of my book, Stunning Digital Photography. The next mode is shutter priority. And I use aperture priority just most of the time for general shooting because I like to control the amount of background blur. Shutter priority I use for any kind of action, sports, wildlife, that sort of thing. Shutter priority is selected on the mode dial here by selecting S. And it controls how long the shutter stays open while you're taking the picture. Now, you might think a pic taking a picture happens in an instant, but it happens over a period of time, and things move during that period of time. So a typical shutter speed might be 1 60th of a second, and everything would look sharp generally. But if somebody were running and you took a picture at 1 60th of a second, their hands and feet would be quite blurred. So you might want to use a faster shutter speed for sports. In shutter priority mode, again, use the main dial to change the shutter speed. So as I roll it to the left, you can see the shutter speed gets slower and slower. This is one tenth of a second. And as I go left further, you can go all the way down to half a second, one full second, or multiple seconds. So you might go all the way to 30 seconds if you were taking a picture under starlight at night, like out in the wilderness. <laughs> if you're in a city taking pictures at night, you still might be at like one twentieth or one tenth of a second. And then for action and stuff, you'll scroll it to the right, get up to say one two fiftieth or so. So this main dial here changes personality. When you're in aperture priority mode, it controls the aperture. When you're in shutter priority mode, it controls the shutter. Let's take a look at a couple of sample pictures. Here are pictures of my daughter on one of those spinny things at the playground. And I'm on the spinny thing with her. So that's why she stays sharp in all the pictures, because I'm also spinning. But you can see at one eighth of a second at a slow shutter speed, the background is completely blurred. At 1 30th, the background is still, there's still movement in it, there's still motion, but it's clearer. And then at 1 1 25th of a second, the background now is basically frozen because that was a fast enough shutter speed to completely freeze motion. Uh, for general shooting, 1 60th of a second is fine. For your kid's birthday party, whatever, that's probably fine. If you're shooting kids' sports, like middle school and younger, I like to shoot at 1 250th. That's usually okay. That will uh, get you nice, clear pictures. If you're shooting high school sports, you might be at 1 500th. In pro sports, you might be at 1 1,000th. You have to, there's no particular rule for it. You have to take some pictures and see if you're getting uh, too much blur. And if you're getting too much blur, then you use a faster shutter speed. Generally, the camera's gonna give you the best image when it gathers as much light as possible. So for that reason, you'll get better images Overall, when you use slower shutter speeds, unless you get camera shake in there, which is generally all over shakiness, or you start to get unwanted motion blur. For detailed image, uh, for detailed information about which camera settings you should use, visit sdp.io slash settings, or again, check chapter four in my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Now let's talk about manual mode. Not as scary as it might seem. Once you figure out how to use aperture priority, and shutter priority, manual mode will feel completely natural. It's indicated by the M on the main dial here, so I'll select that now. And now I can separately control both the shutter speed and the aperture. The aperture is set on the main dial, just as it was in aperture priority, and the shutter speed is set on the secondary dial here, this ring. Now you'll notice as I'm flipping through shutter speeds here that the image isn't getting brighter or darker. And that's because this particular camera is still set in auto ISO, and that's the default. And I'll discuss ISO in just a little bit. Now, if you want detailed information about how to choose your settings and how to go manual, 
visit stp.io slash go manual, or again, check chapter four in my book, Stunning Digital Photography. If you're interested in actually learning photography, it's a lot more than just learning which buttons to push on your camera. I have many books that can help you. My book, Stunning Digital Photography, teaches actual photographic techniques. So all these things like shutter speed, aperture, they'll all make perfect sense. These tutorials go along with my book because every book has buttons in different places, so I'm just kind of showing you how to use the controls. But this will teach you things like mood and expression and timing and storytelling and getting the right pose out of people and making people look awesome, making yourself look awesome. I cover everything from wildlife to portraits to landscapes, travel photography, whatever you're interested in. If you get into post-processing, if your pictures start to be too numerous to easily organize, you'll want Adobe Lightroom, my favorite app for editing and for organizing pictures. I have a book on that. These books include lots of video too, so if you're not a book person, you can just watch the video. Stunning Digital Photography is over 12 hours of video, 14 hours now, and it comes with free updates, and it comes with a Facebook group you can join for peop where people will help you out. And <laughs> you can take quizzes at the end of each chapter to reinforce your learning. It comes with lots of practices, hands-on practices that you can do. Of course, all those things are optional. You can do as much or as little as you want. It starts at 10 bucks, so it's a really good deal. It's the number one photography book in the world. Check out the reviews on Amazon. You don't have to trust me. Go look at those <laughs> reviews. My Lightroom book is equally well-liked. It also has tons of samples and uh, presets, and also it's for a fantastic price. If you're interested in the gear part of it, what, all, what lenses you should buy, what things like chromatic aberration, vignetting, moiré, what all those terms mean, bokeh, check out my photography buying guide. It's like 400 pages now, packed with information, lots of recommendations for lenses, bodies, and it can save you hundreds or thousands of dollars. Give them a shot. You can check it out at sdp.io slash store or to search my name, Tony Northrop, at Amazon or really any bookstore. Thanks. Bulb mode. If you read Stunning Digital Photography, you'll learn about bulb mode in the night photography chapter. You can use bulb mode to keep your shutter open for longer than 30 seconds. Like if you're shooting star trails, you might want to keep your shutter open for 10 full minutes. The way bulb mode works is you'll put the camera into manual mode and then use the dial on the back, the secondary dial, scroll it all the way to the left until you get to past 30 seconds and then to bulb. And bulb mode keeps the shutter open as long as you hold your finger down on the shutter button. So if you hold it down for five seconds, you get a five second exposure. If you hold it down for 20 minutes, you get a 20 minute exposure. Now, of course, you're probably not gonna to wanna to stand there with your finger on the shutter button for 20 minutes. So you'll do well if you wanna use bulb mode to get yourself an electronic shutter release. But really, there aren't too many situations nowadays where I recommend using bulb mode. So don't go out and rush to buy an accessory. I just wanted to show you where it was in case you're working through the book. If you are interested in night photography, you can read chapter 10 in Sunny Digital Photography, or you can get some free resources at stp.io slash NP. If you're interested in landscape photography, of course, there's a chapter in STP, or there are free resources at stp.io slash LS. Incidentally, this is a great camera for both night photography and landscape photography, largely because it's, it's so small and it has really good image quality. It's not the best camera for wildlife photography, mostly because Sony doesn't have a lot of good wildlife lenses yet. We hope to see them in the future, but if you are interested in learning more about wildlife photography, more free resources, stp.io slash WL. Now let's talk about different shutter modes. By changing the shutter mode, you can make the camera take multiple pictures at one time. And in fact, this camera can take like 11 frames a second. It can be really fast, but by default, it's just going to take one picture when you push the shutter, even if you hold it down like that. So to change the shutter mode, you look for, see the little stack of copies right there? <laughs> You'll push the dial in that direction, and now you can scroll down through different shutter modes. The first one here is continuous shooting high. And this will take eight frames a second. So I'll select that, and now as I hold the shutter down, this is the mode you should use for things like sports or action. Now, I'll do that again, and you can see that when I have that selected, I can scroll either left or right for different modes. If I scroll left, I can select high plus mode, and this will shoot even faster. But maybe you didn't notice that difference. When you are shooting at 11 frames a second, you don't see a real-time view of what's happening, and that makes it almost impossible to track moving subjects. So 
drop it down to standard high mode for things like sports, and as you can see on the viewfinder, you actually get a glimpse of what's happening in real time. And that just means that you can keep a subject in your field of view while you're moving, because otherwise you're, you're seeing everything just a little bit behind and it's really difficult to track anything. I'll scroll to the left again here, and I'm in high mode now. I can also scroll down to continuous shooting mid or continuous shooting low if that eight frames a second is too fast for me, if I'm taking too many pictures. So you can see that's a slower pace. Sometimes that, that's a good pace for taking a few portraits because eight frames a second can be a little too fast for portraits. You can also scroll down here for different self timer modes. So this first option here, you'll see it's a 10 second self timer. Use that when you wanna want to include yourself in a picture. You'll put the camera on a tripod and then do that thing where you run around and put your arm behind your family and smile and everybody is in the picture. That's what that's for. You don't need a separate cable release. You can also scroll to the right and select a five second timer or a two second timer. The two second timer is useful for getting sharper pictures anytime you have the camera on a tripod. So if I'm, especially if I'm doing night photography or macro photography, I'll have the camera on a tripod and then I'll turn that two second timer on and I'll push the shutter. See the yellow light comes on and then it takes the picture. And by putting that two second delay in, it means any shake that I introduce by pushing the shutter button will be eliminated. And believe it or not, that two second delay is enough to give you much sharper pictures when you're using a tripod. You can see the difference. After you change the shutter mode, you'll wanna go back and just, just change it back because otherwise you'll forget and the next time you go to take a picture of some, some fast moving thing, you're still gonna have it in that two or 10 second delay mode and you're gonna be very confused about what's going on. So as a general rule, I go, always go back and I set it back to continuous shooting high. That's my favorite mode. Now, before we move on, there are other uh, delayed shooting modes here. So if you scroll down to the last option there, the, the fourth option, you can see there's a self timer that waits 10 seconds and takes three pictures. That's even better for those pictures with your family because that way you have a better chance of getting one image with everybody's eyes open and nobody sticking their tongue out. You can scroll to the right and you can see a 10 second delay with five images, five second delay with three images, five seconds with five images, two seconds with three images, or two seconds with five images. So this fourth option here just gives you more permutations on delays and multiple pictures. And if you scroll down below that, you'll see a couple of options for bracketing. And bracketing takes multiple pictures sequentially with different settings. And bracketing is good for taking HDR images, high dynamic range images where you can capture lots of detail, noise-free detail in the shadows as well as not avoiding blowing out the sky. So you could have a well-exposed picture of a scene with, without losing any detail in the shadows or the clouds. It's something I cover in chapter 11 of Stunning Digital Photography. But if you want to turn bracketing on, go down to this option here. You can see it's labeled continuous bracket. And then you can scroll to the right to select different levels of bracketing, different differences in the, ex the brightness of the exposure and how many pictures you take. And I'll just tell you the, the one setting that I basically always use, I'll scroll all the way over, is 3EV5 image. That will cover just about any scene. In fact, it might be more pictures than you need but it will definitely not be not enough pictures. And it's always better to have too many than not enough pictures because it's easy to delete pictures afterwards. So if I am shooting HDR, that's the option that I will choose. Uh, I have never found any reason to use these other bracketing options, so I won't even cover them. Once again, now that I've shown you bracketing, I'm gonna go back and select continuous shooting high so that the camera is ready the next time I go to pick it up. By default, the camera is in an automatic focusing mode where it will try to figure out whether you're focusing on a still subject or a moving subject. And it's not always good at guessing. Sometimes you'll be trying to focus on a still subject and it will start to hunt a little bit, or you'll try to focus on a moving subject and it will decide that it's still and it will actually miss it. So I always prefer to tell the camera whether I'm focusing on a moving subject or a still subject. You can change the focusing modes in a very similar way. What you'll do is by default, you can press the FN button here, the function button. And this brings up just a bunch of quick options. There are lots of useful settings here, but right in the middle of the top row there, you'll see focus mode and it's set to AFA right now. 
So I'll select that, and you can see I can switch between, AFA is automatic. AFS is single focus mode. You can think of it as stationary focus mode. And AFC is continuous focus mode. So you'll use AFS for almost everything because continuous focus can be a little bit flaky. There's a lot of hunting in continuous focus. So you really only wanna use it for those subjects that absolutely are moving like sports. So for sports, I'll select function mode, I'll select focus mode, and then I'll go down to AFC. If you get more advanced, you can start doing manual focus. DMF allows both autofocus and allows you to grab the focusing ring and change the focus. And to demonstrate that, I'll actually switch lenses here. So I'm gonna put on the Sony 18 to 105 lens because this lens has a separate focusing and zoom ring. So I'll put that on. And so now we can see the camera autofocus in DMF mode, and then I can grab that zoom ring and zoom it in and out. DMF is my favorite mode to work in most of the time. The downside to DMF is sometimes you'll accidentally hit that focusing ring and then it goes into manual focus mode. So unless you really do sometimes manually focus, I suggest using AFS instead. The last option here is manual focus, which will turn completely turn off uh, autofocus and requires you to just completely manually focus. Now, I, some people get into photography thinking that manual everything is better and therefore manual focus must be better than autofocus. And that we don't find that to be true. Even pros generally use autofocus because it's, it's more precise. It's, it's faster and more accurate than the human eye and the human hand can possibly be. For that reason, we don't recommend using manual focus that often. As with other things, if you go in and select manual focus, after you're done, you should go back and select an autofocus mode just so the camera's ready for the next time you pick it up. For more information about focusing modes, watch the video at sdp.io slash focus. Now let's talk about the focusing areas. By default, the A6300 will focus anywhere on the screen. It might decide that it can focus at the top of the screen or the side of the screen, and that can be fine. That's good for general shooting for people who, who don't really think about where they're focusing. But if you get a, especially if you get a lens with shallow depth of field, like this 50 millimeter F1.8 here, you'll want to be very precise about where you focus. For example, in a portrait, you wanna make sure you focus on the nearest eye. Anything else will look a little bit unnatural because the eye will be out of focus if you focus anywhere else. If you don't specifically select the eye, then the camera's gonna, every, the picture's gonna be a little bit blurry. So for, with your kit lens for general shooting, the default focusing area is fine, but as you get more advanced, you'll wanna take control of that. To do that, again, you'll press the function button there. And then the focus area option is the next one over. So I'll select that. And you can see I can scroll vertically to select different focusing areas. By default, it's set to wide, which has the camera focus anywhere in the scene that it thinks is a priority. Usually it's the closest thing to the camera that it will focus on. You can also select a zone mode, which will allow you to move this kind of big block of focusing points around the scene. It's not something I typically use. The center always focuses in the middle. So you can see there, it'll focus in the middle. And that, that can be useful because when you focus in the middle like that, you can do a technique called focus and recompose, where you focus on something and then you reframe the picture to move that object out of the middle of the frame. Because so you might want to use, for example, the rule of thirds, a technique I teach in SDP. That can be easily accomplished with uh, that center focusing point. Though it's generally better to select the focusing point uh, closest to your subject so you don't have to recompose the picture. And to do that, you would select the flexible spot focusing mode, which is right below that flexible spot. And you can scroll to the left or to the right to select large, medium, and small focusing spots. Now, you might think for things like precise focusing, you should always use the smallest focusing spot. And indeed, that will be the most precise. But the smaller focusing spots are actually slower on the A6300. So the bigger the focusing spot you use, the faster focusing is going to be, but the less precise it might be. So for example, if you are taking a portrait and you use a large focusing spot to focus on the person's eye, the camera might decide to focus on the nose because it might be inside the focusing spot. So the smaller focusing spot might, will be more likely to actually grab onto the eye, but it will take longer too. <laughs> 
After you select that focusing mode, you can move the focusing point all around the screen using the directional pads here. And then just click the center point there and you can see the camera will focus on that spot. So that's a great way to use the rule of thirds, for example. Just position the focusing point over on the left or right third, focus on your subject, and take your picture. Now there's another focusing mode that's only available when you're using continuous shooting and it's lock on spot AF and it's good for sports. I'll show you how that works. First, I'm gonna go to the focusing mode and select it, set it to AFC. Now I'll hit the function button again and go over to focus area and scroll down to lock on AF. If it's not available, if it's dimmed or disabled, then it's because you're in like single focus mode or manual focus mode. So set it to AFC. So I'll select that now and then select my focusing point. Usually you want it somewhere in the middle. This is a, the best mode for sports for the most part. You'll select that and then you can see it will track subjects as they move through the frame. So what I've done here is I'll focus on the A. I'll push the shutter button halfway down and now it locks on. And then if I move the camera like that, it will try to stay locked on that same subject. So if you're taking pictures of your kid's basketball game, you could put that in the middle of the frame, focus on your kid, and then just try to keep them in the frame. And the camera will do its best to focus on your kid. Now, if somebody passes in front of them, it might lose track of your kid and focus on something else. It can be kind of a pain that way. It's not completely reliable, but it is a good way to keep sports subjects in focus. And again, I'm going to go back and reset the focusing mode so that I'm ready for the next time I shoot so that I'm not confused the next time I pick up my camera. If you find yourself using something other than the wide autofocus area, you'll be moving the focusing point around a lot or you might be moving the focusing point around a lot. I know I do. And uh, it, can be, it can require a couple of button presses by default. Go to sdp.io slash tutorials and watch that customizing Sony cameras tutorial at the very bottom of that page because I show you techniques for making moving, changing between focusing points as easy and as fast as possible. The A6300 has a fairly amazing face detection feature where it will try to find a face in the scene and automatically focus on that face. It can be a real time saver, meaning you don't have to change the focusing point. It's also not completely accurate. Sometimes it'll focus on the wrong face or it simply won't see a face at all. So it's not completely reliable, but it is useful. Make sure, for general shooting, I like to have it turned on. So I'll hit the menu button up here to bring up the menu system. And then with the camera icon selected here, I'll scroll over to page six. You can scroll left and right. Get to page six and then at the bottom, you'll see smile slash face detection. And uh, I generally like to have that turned on. Now you'll see some options here for things like turning face detection off, um, using uh, registering faces, which means you could register your family's faces and, and then prioritize them. I find that to be way more trouble than it's worth, so I don't tend to use that. Um, I just leave face detection on. You'll also see the option for the smile shutter, which will automatically take a picture when people smile. I, I don't personally use that. I just use my finger to push the shutter when people smile because I can keep keep track of that. So for me, face detection is on, um, but there is a downside to face detection. Based on my conversations with Sony, when you turn face detection on, it taxes the camera a little bit, slowing down overall focusing. So you actually get worse focusing performance when you have the face detection on. So if you're shooting sports and you're selecting your focusing point manually, turn face detection off and you'll actually get better focusing performance. Besides detecting faces, this camera can also detect eyes and that's useful for shallow depth of field portraiture. You won't really need it at any other time and in fact, as with face detect, it can actually slow things down a little bit. The best way to use eye detection is to map it to a custom key so that you can easily turn it on when you are trying to take a portrait. So to do that, I'll hit the menu button here and now you want to go to the gear icon, scroll over to the gear icon and page seven, and then go down to custom key shoot. So I'll select that. And where I tend to map the eye detection is to the center button. So I'll select the center button and then select IAF. And so now with that enabled, when I push the center button here, it will look for an eye in the picture and try to focus on it. So with this picture pulled up on the screen, you can see 
face detect is clicking in here, you can see it's drawing a box around the face. And then if I hit the center button here, you can see it's drawing a green box around the near eye. And that means it's focused on the near eye and I'm ready to snap that picture. You can see sometimes it's switching over to the other eye. It, it should pick the near eye, but sometimes it, it will kind of lose it. Eye detect is not 100%. If you're in a heavily backlit situation, eye detect might not see the eyes at all. If somebody blinks, it's going to lose focus and therefore might hunt in and out and kind of delay things. So I'm always kind of like, uh, it's, it's, it's hit or miss. In a casual situation with shallow depth of field, I might use it. But in professional situations, I tend not to prefer it just because it can, it can throw off the pacing of the entire shoot. For more information on using eye detect, go to that customizing Sony video at stp.io slash tutorials. Focus peaking is a really useful feature, feature for those of you who might be manually focusing. For example, if you're adapting lenses or you're shooting video, I'll show you focus peaking here as I zoom in. Oh, first I'm going to have to turn on manual focus. So I'll hit the FN button and then go to focus mode and set it to manual focus. So with manual focus on, you can now see the focus peaking. It's showing me the in focus parts of the frame in yellow. So as you can see, as I focus in that, it becomes yellow. So as I move back a little bit, you can see different parts of the word get to be in focus. And one thing I warned you about focus peaking is it's, it's not precise or perfect. It just looks for areas of high contrast in the scene. It, it's, it's a helpful general guide. But just because something is highlighted there doesn't mean it's going to be exactly in focus. You'll definitely get pictures back where you're like, focus peaking said it was in focus and it's definitely blurry. But it's better than nothing, especially if you're manually focusing. To turn focus peaking on, I'll hit the menu button here. And then on the gear icon, page one, I'll go to MF Assist and make sure that's turned on. Then on page two, I'll scroll down to peaking level, and I usually like to have it at low, make sure it's not off. And then I'll set the peaking color to a color that's not in the picture. So if I were taking a picture of bananas, a yellow peaking color wouldn't be that useful. I would set it to red or something instead, but I don't photograph yellow subjects that often, so yellow seems to work okay for me. Again, focus peaking, just useful for those of you who are manually focusing. One of the most important exposure settings is ISO. For more information about ISO, go to sdp.io slash ISO. We have a whole video about it. It basically controls the brightness of your image. So if you're shooting in low light, dark situations, you'll be using a really high ISO. And if you're shooting in full sunlight, you'll be using a low ISO. If you shot in the film days, you might remember you'd get ISO or ASA 100 film for shooting outside in the sun, and then you'd get ISO 800 or ISO 1600 film for shooting indoors or in dimly lit situations. You don't have to change film anymore. <laughs> you can just change the ISO setting. To do that, you'll see ISO is written here to the left of the directional pad. Just select that. And by default, the camera will be in auto. And auto is so useful. <laughs> I, I leave ISO in auto almost all the time because it just lets the camera make the, the right choice. And the camera's probably better at it than most people are. And it's also faster. It's quicker to adapt to changing lighting conditions. Like even somebody moving from in front of to behind the light will dramatically change the situation, much less a cloud passing in front of the sun. So even when I'm in manual mode, I'm probably in auto ISO. But if you do want to set it, scroll to the right here, and then you can just scroll down through all the different ISO settings. Using a high ISO will allow you to use a really fast shutter speed or a high f-stop number to get a ton of depth of field. And that might seem useful, but high ISOs also give you a lot more noise. So again, for detailed information about this setting, visit stp.io slash ISO. If the camera's auto exposure system is not making the right choice, if it's making the picture too dark or too bright, you can use exposure compensation to change that. Now, you'll want to make sure that exposure compensation is turned on for the secondary dial because if you're in aperture priority or shutter priority mode, you can control the exposure compensation by turning the secondary wheel here. So you can see as I go to the left, the image gets very dark, and as I go to the right, it gets much brighter. Now, when it's set to zero, that means this is what the camera thinks the brightness of the scene should be. But you can see, as you look at the screen, my screen should be white, and the white part of the screen is actually kind of gray. So because the scene is fully white, the camera doesn't want to make it too bright, so it makes it all kind of gray. And me being a human, I'm smarter than a camera, 
So I know I need to crank up that exposure compensation when a scene is mostly white. You'll make the same kind of choice when you're taking a picture in a snowy scene, for example. To make sure that exposure compensation is linked to the secondary dial so that you can easily change it, I'll hit the menu button and I'll go to the gear page here and let's scroll over to the right. Let's go to dial slash wheel EV comp here on page seven and I'll select that and make sure it's set to wheel. It might be turned off, in which case the dial would do nothing, but it's generally better to have it set to wheel. Now, as with other things, if you crank up or down the exposure compensation after you're done, set it back to zero so that the next picture you take isn't wildly overexposed. Fortunately, with this camera, you would see it on the background. Now, for detailed information, go to stp.io ec or check chapter four in my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Zebras will show you which parts of the picture are overexposed. And if a picture is underexposed, you can usually brighten it up in post. Things might be a little noisier, but it won't be lost. But if something's overexposed, it can be lost forever. So having the camera show you which parts of the picture are overexposed can be terribly useful. To turn zebras on, I'll hit the menu button here. And then on the gear icon, page one, I'll select the top option here, which is zebra. You can see it's off now. So as I look at the screen here, you can see when it's set to 70, now the zebras are highlighting the parts of the picture that are 70% bright or higher. So parts of my screen here are too bright and are just going to, they're not going to be completely overexposed, they're just over 70%. And as I go higher here, you can see 75%, 80%, 85%, and so on. So when I have it at 100%, you'll only see parts of the picture that are absolutely too bright, like the reflection of this light here. And that's all I really care about. I don't mind if some part of the picture is 95% exposed. That means it's, it's not overexposed. So I'll turn zebras on and set it to 100. I find that feature to be really useful. You can also see it when you're looking through the viewfinder. Let's quickly go over the Wi-Fi features. If you're like me, you're constantly connected to Instagram, Twitter, etc. The Wi-Fi app and features on this camera are actually pretty useful. It First, you have to establish a connection between your camera and your phone. Actually, that's second. Because the first thing you have to do is get the app installed on your smartphone. The app is available for both iPhone and Android. And uh, look in your app store. It's called, and this is going to make no sense, it's called Play Memories Mobile. <laughs> it's free. So get that installed. And if you have an Android phone and it has NFC, as most Android's phones do, you can establish the connection between the phone and the camera, hopefully, by like rubbing on it. So you can see in the grip here, this is the NFC icon. And I'll just try to like rub it together. <laughs> and hopefully that should do the trick. You know what? It just, sometimes it doesn't work with this camera. It, it usually works with my other Sonys, but I don't know if maybe the app needs to be updated or something. It doesn't see it. So it, it might pop up and connect automatically for you. It's not doing it for us today, but if you have an iPhone or a phone without NFC, you have to manually connect anyway. So the thing to do is hit the menu button here, go up to this little dot with radiating lines, the international symbol for wireless connections, and um, choose send to smartphone. That's the way I prefer to use it. So I'll do that and then select on smartphone because it has a touch screen and such. Okay, it's got to recover the database. All right, so now it's in Wi-Fi standby mode and you can see it shows you some data, it shows you a QR code. And this means the phone itself is now a wireless access point. It won't get to the internet, but it will let your phone communicate with your camera. And you can see the SSID, the SID. This is your wireless network name, device slash BEF0, whatever. And so what I'm gonna do on my phone is I'm going to pull up the Wi-Fi networks iPhone works exactly the same way. Select the network for my phone. I need to type the password in here. You can see the camera is telling me to push the trash can button to connect with the password. So I'll push that and now it's showing me the password. So I need to now type that password into my phone. It's not real convenient, but you only really have to do this the first time. Okay, so now the camera says it's sharing and the phone says it's connected. So now I'll go back into my Play Memories mobile app. 
and you can see under connect to camera, it's showing that the camera is there. So now I can select that. And you can see it's showing me the pictures that I've taken in this session. Oh, look, there's a picture of Justin <laughs> hard at work that I must have accidentally taken that's not even focused. So you can flip through your pictures here. I don't have any good pictures, but I'll take the slightly blurry picture of Justin. And so now I can share it. And to share it, I'll first want to transfer it to the phone. So I'll push this button here and it transfers it to the phone, tells me that the item is copied. I can also hit this menu icon in the upper right corner and click share. And it just warns me that it's going to open another application. And now it brings up the, the phone's options for sharing. So for example, I might want to put this on Instagram. And you can see it's, it's pretty good about it. It gives you the chance to add some hashtags like hashtag Sony Alpha, and you can tag users and such, and then just hit the check mark here and click OK. So now, because it was connected to the camera's Wi-Fi network, it was unable to get to the internet. So the smartphone had to disconnect from the camera. So I'll have to go back and, and reconnect after I'm done. But for sharing one picture at a time, this is OK. For sharing multiple pictures, I would just transfer them all to your phone at once and then open up the individual apps and, and pull them out from your phone. Um, but you can see I'm now into Instagram. so. Um, that's done. I've successfully transferred my pictures. And when I've been out in the field working, I'll, I'll frequently do that to share pictures in real time of whatever it is that I'm shooting. Now I'll talk about shooting JPEG versus RAW. If you aren't familiar with these terms, most pictures you see on the web and most pictures cameras take are JPEG. And JPEG is a highly compressed format. So it uses, it gets small file sizes by throwing out data that it thinks is, is unnecessary. But some of that data you, you might actually want. Like some of it is shadow detail, or some of it is detail from uh, blown out skies that you might want to be able to recover later. If you record images in RAW files, you can go back with an app like Adobe Lightroom and, and recover that information and actually make your pictures look much better with just a little bit of editing. RAW files are great for fixing your own mistakes. If you had the wrong exposure, if you had the wrong white balance, you can probably fix it by shooting RAW. To understand the difference between RAW and JPEG, watch this, VT, DT, watch this video, sdp.io slash RAW v JPEG. Sounds like a very serious uh, legal case, doesn't it? If you decide that you want to shoot RAW, you can turn it on by hitting the menu button here, and then on the camera icon, page one, go down to quality. You can see right now it's set to extra fine, I'm going to set it to RAW. And now the camera's taking RAW pictures. You won't be able to share RAW images directly. You'll have, to trans you'll have to convert them into JPEG first. But an app like Adobe Lightroom can do that for you automatically and will actually give you much better, noticeably better image quality than just the JPEG. So JPEG's great for casual sh shooters, but everybody I know who's even moderately serious pretty much shoots RAW. I'll show you briefly the different metering modes uh, you, because you'll probably never need to change this. It wouldn't hurt my feelings if you just jumped right to the next section. But the metering mode is how the camera determines how bright or dark the scene should be. And the default setting is fine. <laughs> Trust me. Um, but if you feel like you want to change it, because I do discuss it in chapter four of studying digital photography, hit the function button here and go over to this icon. Second column, second row and select it, and now you can switch between multi, which is the default, and the one you should pretty much use, center or spot metering, uh, each of which uses a smaller and smaller part of the scene to determine the overall brightness of the image. Again, multi is very intelligent. It's almost always gonna be the right thing to do, but that's how you change it if you absolutely must. This camera does have uh, kind of a mm, not great onboard flash, so you could use it in a pinch to add a little bit of extra light to the room, but I, I never do. I just never do. I would rather shoot without the flash and just use natural light, even in dim light. But if you decide that you do want to use the flash, uh, I'll show you how to turn it on. The button on the back here has the lightning bolt icon, which is the international symbol for the flash. And just watch how adorable that is when I pop, push that. Boop. Oh my goodness, it's, it's just the cutest little guy in the world. It just, it reminds me of Johnny Five. Look at that little thing. And um, it won't always flash, but 
if you have it in automatic mode and uh, it needs the light, it will flash. If you want to control the flash, hit the function button here, and then second column, first row, you can select that and choose to use fill flash, which it will do automatically when you're in aperture and shutter priority mode. Fill flash adds a little bit of light, which can, can be pleasing if used carefully by adding a little light to the eye. So it's, it's so close to the, the camera that I wouldn't normally use it. Uh, you can also choose between slow sync and rear sync. And you, you'll notice that the flash, op flash off option is disabled here because if you want to turn the flash off, just push it down. <laughs> Think of it that way. If you are using the flash and it's too much or not enough, you can use flash exposure compensation to control the brightness of the flash. So I'll, I'll pop that flash back out and then I'll hit the function button again. And this third icon here, you can see it's labeled flash compensation. It's got a lightning bolt, which is the symbol for flash and then a plus and minus, which is the symbol for exposure compensation. So I'll select that and then I can dial it back. And when I do use fill flash, I'll use it usually at minus 1.3 stops. That doesn't completely blind the person. It still lets some ambient light get in the room and will overall be a much more pleasing picture. So I, I kind of leave it at that. But if you want more or less flash in your scene after taking a sample picture, that's how you'd go in and adjust the total output. White balance is another thing that I, I suggest leaving at the default. It's usually not worth worrying about, especially if you shoot raw, you can perfectly change white balance later with absolutely no penalty whatsoever. But if you do want to change the white balance, hit the function button here and then scroll over to the third column, second row. You'll see right now it's labeled white balance. Right now it's set to AWB, which is auto white balance. So I'll select that and then I can select the the light, the ambient light in the, for the room that I'm in. So you'll see options for daylight, for shade, for cloudy, for incandescent, uh, and then for just various options like underwater. And what this will do is it will fix any color problems that you're currently having as a result of being in unnatural light. You'll notice if you take pictures under incandescent lights, the whole scene will appear a little yellow orange. If you take it under most LEDs, the whole scene will appear a little cool, a little bit blue. You can fix that and make it look more like it does with, the, with, your, in, with your eye by manually setting the white balance. But this camera in particular does a really good job of setting the auto white balance. So I, I leave it on auto white balance and I change it in post. But if you're working through chapter three of sending digital photography, which discusses white balance in detail, that's where you'd go in to fix it. Now I'll talk a little bit about video because this is a very good video camera. First, I'll mention putting it into video mode. This camera will record video in any mode just by pushing the record button here. But if you actually put it into video mode, which is this thing that looks like an old timey film, then it will actually crop the image down to 16 by nine for you. Um, and that makes it so that if you don't do that, then as soon as you start recording, then it will actually crop the image afterwards and you have to kind of recompose the picture. So basically if I'm shooting video, I switch to that mode first so I can more accurately preview what the recorded image is actually going to be like. Now, this camera has a wide variety of video modes and they can be awesome. For example, it can record 4K, which is, you know, standard HD. It's actually like four HD pictures. So it's, it's eight megapixel images at 30 frames a second. Pretty amazing stuff. It can also record 120 frames a second, which lets you do four or five times slow motion effects. If you're doing post-processing, if you can edit your videos together, I'll just show you how to select those. So I'll hit the menu button. I'll go to the camera icon, page two. And first we can change the file format. I usually will use XAVC. It's a well accepted format, it's pretty efficient. And then either HD for slow motion effects or 4K. By default, I usually shoot 4K because I like the extra resolution. It makes an incredibly sharp image. And it means five, 10 years from now, and when, your future grandkids are looking at videos, they won't feel like it is incredibly unsharp because you don't necessarily need a 4K TV now to appreciate it because much of your videos you might want to be viewed in the future. And trust me, 4K video looks better on high resolution displays than HD does. So after you select the file format, you can select the record setting. And for 4K, you have the options of 30p at 100 megabits or 24p at 100 megabits. So 24p is kind of the, the film standard. Uh, and 30p 
is kind of the video standard. So for me, I'm pretty much at 4K and 30 frames a second, 30p. Uh, I will say that when you're at 24p, there's a little bit less of a crop. So when you're at 30p, it will actually crop the image down substantially. So if you're shooting wide angle, it won't be as wide angle, and that can be kind of a nuisance. The crop is less with 24p. Also, you'll get noticeably cleaner images when you're shooting in low light if you're shooting at 24p. It just basically gathers more light, so there'll be less noise. Now, this camera has very clean images in almost all lighting situations, and for that reason, I don't hesitate to shoot at 4K 30p. But technically, you do get better image quality at 4K and 24p. So, those are the 4K modes, and now, if you do want to shoot, say, slow motion, you would go in and select XAVC HD, and now your record setting options are different. Now you can see the last thing I did was I was shooting at 120p, 100 megs. So in my post-processing app, I use Premiere Pro. If I slow that, slow that down to 30p, I can now see 4x slow motion, and it looks awesome. But if you just want regular video, you could jump to 60p or 30p or even 24p. So those will make smaller files for you, um, but they might not be as cool as cool slow motion. Th those are the most important things to know about video. I will say, I would always select manual focus mode um, on this camera for video, because if you have any of the autofocus modes and you try to record video, it's gonna be hunting in and out. It's also worth investing in a good tripod because handheld video is kind of shaky and gross to watch. And another tip, just avoid zooming in and out while recording it can do it does a decent job and a nice slow zoom with the kit lens and that little slider can be okay but don't be doing like fast pulls and lots of panning like this It'll, you'll make people nauseous if you want to shoot a time lapse or star trails you can use an interval timer in this camera unfortunately it's not built in it's kind of a pain but i want to show you where it was so hit the menu button here and then go up to these little blocks and then you can go to application list and um, play memories camera apps. You have to install a separate app that actually costs you some money to do the interval timer. So what it's doing now is it's connecting to the web and it's pulling down a web page quite slowly. And then scroll over to the time lapse app here. Uh, I guess I haven't installed it on this camera, but I have it. I use it on other cameras and it works. And I'm not even gonna to try to purchase it now because it's it's a real pain. You have to like type your credit card number in and address and everything. Um, but once you get it installed, you'll be able to launch the app in the same way and it will basically reboot your camera in a separate time-lapse mode that will let you take pictures at an interval. So you could take a picture every 30 seconds or every five seconds. Again, for making star trails pictures or time-lapse pictures without requiring, time-lapse videos, without requiring a separate external accessory I do recommend it, even though it's not perfect. Um, but because the login and purchase process is so <laughs> lengthy, I'll let you figure that out on your own. It's, it's not too bad to do. If you fill up your memory card, you can format it and reuse it. Of course, you wanna make sure that you transfer all your pictures over to your computer first. So hit the menu button, and then I'll go to the toolbox icon here and scroll over to format on page five and I'll select enter and this formats the memory card removing all the existing images now again you should make sure you have your pictures copied to your computer and then you should make sure your computer is backed up just in case disaster strikes if you format the memory card and you did not need to did not mean to you can go back and recover those pictures take your memory card out don't take any more pictures because that will overwrite the remnants of your images then put your picture, your memory card, in a computer and get the free tool from stp.io slash photo rec. That will allow you to recover your images and it works great. You will, when you go to Google it, you will find lots of tools that will charge you 20, 50, 100 bucks to try to recover your pictures. They're scams. They're all basically selling you this free tool. So use that free tool. It, it can also save data from like crashed hard drives and stuff. It's terribly, terribly useful. Um, your camera probably makes beeps when it does things like focus or selects different modes. I'm gonna ask you to turn that off because it's annoying to the people around you. 
it's from being a wedding photographer. Anytime there's a quiet church, everybody in the stands is trying to take a picture with their camera, and that would be okay, but the most annoying part is they're all going beep, 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 beep. So if you turn that off, life for everyone around you is gonna be much easier. So I'll hit the menu button, and then under the toolbox tab up here, I'll go down to audio signals, and then turn that off. And you can see I already have it off because I would not have gotten through recording this video if I had the audio signals turned on. Um, one more reminder that I have a, a free video that will show you how to customize your Sony at stp.io slash mysony. So once you get through all this and you figure out the basic controls, go there. Customizing the Sony can definitely make using your Sony much more efficient. So now I'm gonna talk about some accessories, both hardware and software, that will make your photography experience much better. Um, the first is software, because you'll be taking a lot of pictures and then finding and editing those pictures can be difficult. Adobe Lightroom makes things much easier. You can get it with Photoshop for 10 bucks a month. It's not too bad. You also get a 30 day free trial. So try it out for free, no problem. If you decide you like it again, I have a Photoshop uh, Lightroom book on it. But go to stp.io slash Adobe deal to pick that up. It's not too bad, it makes life much easier. I'm also gonna rec recommend you buy a couple additional batteries. This Sony uses the NPFW50 battery. Uh, you can pick them up from this link here. And uh, for me, I need three batteries to get through a day of shooting, to be confident that I'm not gonna run out of batteries. So if I'm going out on vacation for a day, I have a battery in the camera and then two extra batteries because that's how many you need to, to shoot a full day, especially if you're shooting video, you might even need more. You can't have too many batteries. So buy a couple of extra batteries. And then again, as I suggested earlier, um, use a USB charger to charge your camera. That can offset some of that too. Um, you might also want to pick up a uh, battery charger, like this double charger from Numoa, which you can pick up at the link shown on the screen here. They're inexpensive and you can put in two batteries at once and that means at the end of the day, when you have those three batteries that you need to recharge, it's a lot easier. You can drop two of them in at once and get both of those charged simultaneously. Let's talk about lenses. My absolute favorite lens with this camera, it almost never comes off the camera, is my 18-105 to f4. It's a Sony G lens. It's really good quality. It's great for video with the little tele and wide angle zoom switch on there. And it's, it's one of the sharpest lenses you can get for the A6300. You can pick it up at stp.io slash Sony 105. Um, it's kind of a super zoom. So you can get telephoto, like even sports pictures, and then go wide angle for things like landscapes and, and general uh, birthday parties and stuff like that. Um, I also, when I feel like being a little more portable, because this lens is just so big and heavy, I really like the 20 millimeter pancake lens. And this is also an inexpensive and fast lens. It's also great in low light because it's an f2.8 lens. So it's in twice the light of this f4 lens, which means half the noise in low light conditions. You can see just how, how nice and small the camera is when that's attached. So this isn't too much smaller than the, the kit lens that probably came with your camera, um, but it's much, much better in low light. And so that's why I kind of like it. The focal length is useful for general shooting too. Anyway, it's just a good one lens to keep on there when you're gonna throw it in your purse or your cargo pants or whatever. Uh, if you want a wider angle lens, which is gonna be necessary if you go to like a national park or a, a small European city where the streets are really narrow, uh, I like the 10 to 18 F4 from Sony. It's a little bit expensive, but you can pick it up at stp.io slash S10. And if you wanna save some money, um, you can learn to shoot a panorama instead and then you don't have to buy a super wide angle lens. I show you how to do that in uh, chapter three or chapter two, chapter two of my book, Stunning Digital Photography, can save you some money. For portraits, I really like this lens, the, the 50 millimeter f1.8. It's, it's enough to get some nice background blur. For headshots, it'll have nice flattering proportions, and it's also at a really good price. Pick it up at that link there. It's, it's probably the first lens I recommend people buy. And if you're shooting sports, check out the Sony 70-200 f4. I own this lens, but I can't show it to you because Justin is using it to film right now. So all that close-up work you saw is being shot with this particular lens. It's, it's a really good and versatile lens and it's also great for portraits. Pick it up at stp.io slash s200f4. And if you are shooting wildlife, right now there really are no wildlife lenses for these Sony mirrorless cameras. And part of it is that the focusing system isn't ideal for that sort of long distance shooting. But I will make a recommendation here that 
that comes in at about as cheap as you're going to get for getting pro-level results. I'm going to suggest you get a used Canon 7D, which should cost you about 500 bucks. You can pick one up at stp.io 7D. Believe it or not, Amazon sells used gear. Just click the little used link and you'll find a bunch of uh, used items that you can return if you're unhappy with them. I do it all the time. It works out great for me. Pick up a used 7D and a used Canon 400mm f5.6 lens. These are built like tanks and they will last forever. We've used this combination for years to produce professional quality, quality wildlife images. The lens itself will cost you about $1,800. So you're looking at $1,300 now for a camera and lens. And even if Sony did make a wildlife lens, it would end up costing you more than $1,300 anyway. So don't hesitate to, to get a second body for the purpose of wildlife. I promise you'll be happy with it. Pick the lens up at scp.io slash c400. If you want great sound like we have here, we're using Sennheiser mics. These Sennheiser wireless labs will produce far, far better sound than the on-camera mic would. You can pick them up at stp.io slash g3. They can be kind of expensive. If it's out of your price range, go to eBay and look up the EW100 G2 mics. They are just about as good. They, they sound the same. They just don't have quite as many features. But if you pick them up used, they can be much, much cheaper. Just know that the ME2 mics, the actual lavalier mic that's connected to the, the body pack, uh, they can get worn out. So you might want to buy a new one of those with the used body pack. If you're looking at making prints of your images, you know, like we used to, take them to the pharmacy to get back a pack of 4x6s, you should do this. You should decorate your walls. Don't just put them on Instagram and Facebook. We make big prints. You can get big, beautiful prints out of this camera. My wife and I have a review of different print services throughout the United States. So if you're in the U.S., go to stp.io slash print it, and you can see us review each of those services. Or you can just go to Mpix. I think that was our favorite one. <laughs> uh, a tripod is necessary for lots of different types of photography, like the selfie where you run around and put your arm around your family, but also things like macro photography and night photography. The tripod I recommend everybody start with is the Dolica tripod. It's fairly inexpensive at 50 bucks. It's lightweight, has a nice hook on the column so you can weigh it down with your bag. It's just a good general tripod. I've sold like hundreds of these to people and they seem to be happy with them. Give it a try at stp.io slash tripod one. Um, another recommendation for uh, getting an SD card, uh, you want a class 10 card if you plan to record 4K. If you don't plan to record 4K, any old cheap SD card will do just fine. Get a big SD card, like 128 gigs is great. 64 gigs is very good too. But I'm also going to suggest buying a bunch of really cheap SD cards. If you look through the list at stp.io slash SD, you can find cards for like six to 10 bucks. Really cheap, small cards. Get half a dozen of those. Get several of them. Put one in your glove compartment of your car. Put one in your purse. Put one in your wallet. Put one uh, anywhere you might be. Leave one in your office desk. You know why? Because at some point you're going to run out of room on your SD card or you're going to forget your SD card in your computer and you're not going to be able to take pictures. Except you'll remember, hey, Tony told me to stash one in my glove box. I'm going to go pull that one out and I'm going to keep shooting. And the most important thing you can do for your photography is to learn photographic techniques. This will do far more for your image quality than any new lens or any amount of figuring out the buttons and dials on this thing. Because the most important part of photography is lighting and mood and expression and storytelling. Composition. How about timing? Figuring out when the sun and the sky look best. Planning your landscape location so you get the very best angle, the very best time of year, at the very best time of day, at the very best location. That's how Ansel Adams would do it. For him, it wasn't all about the gear. I will teach you all of these techniques for just 10 bucks, seriously from stunning digital photography. And if you don't believe me, go to Amazon, look me up, Tony Northrup, and you can check out the reviews on it. Or you can buy it directly from us. We ship worldwide at stp.io slash store. 10 bucks for the eBooks, 20 bucks, 20 bucks for the paperback books. They all come with a ton of videos. So if you're not a reader, just watch the videos, just join the Facebook group, just get feedback from other people learning photography. They can help you out with your questions. We also have books covering Lightroom for photo editing, Photoshop for serious photo editing, the buying guide, which helps, helps you pick the best lenses, flashes, cameras, accessories, and explains all these technical terms of photography in great amounts of detail. And if you just want basic video training without having to read 
we have a video training series too. I hope this has helped. Uh, you should also subscribe to this channel for three new free videos every week. Give me a like to let me know that this video was helpful. Share it with your friends. And if you have any questions, you can add a comment. Thank you so much.